Section two of Four Weird Tales by Algernon Blackwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Four Weird Tales by Algernon Blackwood. The Insanity of Jones. Chapter two. It was the habit of Jones since he was compelled to work among conditions that were utterly distasteful, to withdraw his mind wholly from business once the day was over. During office hours he kept the strictest possible watch upon himself, and turned the key on all inner dreams, lest any sudden uprush from the deeps should interfere with his duty. But once the working day was over, the gates flew open, and he began to enjoy himself." He read no modern books on the subjects that interested him, and, as already said, he followed no course of training, nor belonged to any society that dabbled with half-told mysteries. But, once released from the office desk in the manager's room, he simply and naturally entered the other region. Because he was an old inhabitant, a rightful denizen, and because he belonged there. It was, in fact, really a case of dual personality— and a carefully drawn agreement existed between Jones of the Fire Insurance Office and Jones of the Mysteries, by the term of which, under heavy penalties, neither region claimed him out of hours. For the moment he reached his rooms under the roof in Bloomsbury, and had changed his city coat to another, the iron doors of the office clanged far behind him, and in front, before his very eyes, rolled up the beautiful gates of ivory, and he entered into the places of flowers and singing and wonderful veiled forms. Sometimes he quite lost touch with the outer world, forgetting to eat his dinner or to go to bed, and lay in a state of trance, his consciousness working far out of the body. And on other occasions he walked the streets on air, halfway between the two regions, unable to distinguish between incarnate and discarnate forms, and not very far, probably, beyond the strata where poets, saints, and the greatest artists have moved and thought and found their inspiration. But this was only when some insistent bodily claim prevented his full release, and more often than not he was entirely independent of his physical portion and free of the real region without let or hindrance. One evening he reached home utterly exhausted after the burden of the day's work. The manager had been more than usually brutal, unjust, ill-tempered, and Jones had been almost persuaded out of his settled policy of contempt into answering back. Everything seemed to have gone amiss, and the man's coarse, unbred nature had been in the ascendant all day long. He had thumped the desk with his great fists, abused, found fault unreasonably, uttered outrageous things, and behaved generally as he actually was beneath the thin veneer of acquired business varnish. He had done and said everything to wound all that was woundable in an ordinary secretary, and though Jones fortunately dwelt in a region from which he looked down upon such a man as he might look down on the blundering of a savage animal, the strain had nevertheless told severely upon him, and he reached home wondering for the first time in his life whether there was perhaps a point beyond which he would be unable to restrain himself any longer. For something out of the usual had happened— at the close of a passage of great stress between the two, every nerve in the secretary's body tingled from undeserved abuse. The manager had suddenly turned full upon him in the corner of the private room where the safes stood, in such a way that the glare of his red eyes, magnified by the glasses, looked straight into his own. And at this very second that other personality in Jones, the one that was ever watching, rose up swiftly from the deeps within and held a mirror to his face. A moment of flame and vision rushed over him, and for one single second, one merciless second of clear sight, he saw the manager as the tall, dark man of his evil dreams, and the knowledge that he had suffered at his hands some awful injury in the past crashed through his mind like the report of a cannon. It all flashed upon him, and was gone, changing him from fire to ice, and then back again to fire, and he left the office with a certain conviction in his heart that the time for his final settlement with the man, the time for the inevitable retribution, was at last drawing very near. According to his invariable custom, however, he succeeded in putting the memory of all this unpleasantness out of his mind with the changing of his office coat, and after dozing a little in his leather chair before the fire, 
he started out as usual for dinner in the soho french restaurant and began to dream himself away into the region of flowers and singing and to commune with the invisibles that were the very source of his real life and being for it was in this way that his mind worked and the habit of years had crystallized into rigid lines along which it was now necessary and inevitable for him to act at the door of the little restaurant he stopped short a half-remembered appointment in his mind he had made an engagement with some one but where or with whom had entirely slipped his memory he thought it was for dinner or else to meet just after dinner and for a second it came back to him that it had something to do with the office but whatever it was he was quite unable to recall it and a reference to his pocket engagement book showed only a blank page evidently he had even omitted to enter it and after standing a moment vainly trying to recall either the time place or person he went in and sat down but though the details had escaped him his subconscious memory seemed to know all about it for he experienced a sudden sinking of the heart accompanied by a sense of foreboding anticipation and felt that beneath his exhaustion there lay a centre of tremendous excitement the emotion caused by the engagement was at work and would presently cause the actual details of the appointment to reappear inside the restaurant the feeling increased instead of passing some one was waiting for him somewhere some one whom he had definitely arranged to meet he was expected by a person that very night and just about that very time but by whom where curious inner trembling came over him and he made a strong effort to hold himself in hand and to be ready for anything that might come and then suddenly came the knowledge that the place of the appointment was this very restaurant and further that the person he had promised to meet was already here waiting somewhere quite close beside him he looked up nervously and began to examine the faces round him the majority of the diners were frenchmen chattering loudly with much gesticulation and laughter and there was a fair sprinkling of clerks like himself who came because the prices were low and the food good but there was no single face that he recognised until his glance fell upon the occupant of the corner seat opposite generally filled by himself there's the man who's waiting for me thought jones instantly he knew it at once the man he saw was sitting well back into the corner with a thick overcoat buttoned tightly up to the chin his skin was very white, and a heavy black beard grew far up over his cheeks. At first the secretary took him for a stranger, but when he looked up and their eyes met, a sense of familiarity flashed across him, and for a second or two Jones imagined he was staring at a man he had known years before. For barring the beard it was the face of an elderly clerk who had occupied the next desk to his own when he first entered the service of the insurance company, and had shown him the most painstaking kindness and sympathy in the early difficulties of his work. But a moment later the illusion passed, for he remembered that Thorpe had been dead at least five years. The similarity of the eyes was obviously a mere suggestive trick of memory. The two men stared at one another for several seconds and then Jones began to act instinctively, and because he had to. He crossed over and took the vacant seat at the other's table facing him, for he felt it was somehow imperative to explain why he was late, and how it was he had almost forgotten the engagement altogether. No honest excuse, however, came to his assistance, though his mind had begun to work furiously. "'Yes, you are late,' said the man quietly, before he could find a single word to utter." but it doesn't matter. Also, you had forgotten the appointment, but that makes no difference either. I knew that there was an engagement, Jones stammered, passing his hand over his forehead, but somehow... You will recall it presently, continued the other in a gentle voice, and smiling a little. It was in deep sleep last night we arranged this, and the unpleasant occurrences of today have for the moment obliterated it. A faint memory stirred within him as the man spoke, and a grove of trees with moving forms hovered before his eyes and then vanished again, while for an instant the stranger seemed to be capable of self-distortion and to have assumed vast proportions with wonderful flaming eyes. "'Oh!' he gasped. "'It was there, in the other region!' "'Of course,' said the other, with a smile that illuminated his whole face." you will remember presently all in good time and meanwhile you have no cause to feel afraid 
There was a wonderful soothing quality in the man's voice, like the whispering of a great wind, and the clerk felt calmer at once. They sat a little while longer, but he could not remember that they talked much or ate anything. He only recalled afterward that the head waiter came up and whispered something in his ear, and that he glanced round and saw the other people were looking at him curiously, some of them laughing, and that his companion then got up and led the way out of the restaurant. They walked hurriedly through the streets, neither of them speaking, and Jones was so intent upon getting back the whole history of the affair from the region of deep sleep that he barely noticed the way they took. Yet it was clear he knew where they were bound for, just as well as his companion, for he crossed the streets often ahead of him, diving down alleys without hesitation, and the other followed always without correction. The pavements were very full, and the usual night crowds of London were surging to and fro in the glare of the shop lights, but somehow no one impeded their rapid movements, and they seemed to pass through the people as if they were smoke. And as they went, the pedestrians and traffic grew less and less, and soon they passed the mansion house, and the deserted space in front of the Royal Exchange, and so on down Fenchurch Street, and within sight of the Tower of London rising dim and shadowy in the smoky air. Jones remembered all this perfectly well, and thought it was his intense preoccupation that made the distance seem so short. But it was when the tower was left behind and they turned northwards that he began to notice how altered everything was, and saw that they were in a neighbourhood where houses were suddenly scarce, and lanes and fields beginning, and that their only light was the stars overhead. And as the deeper consciousness more and more asserted itself to the exclusion of the surface happenings of his mere body during the day, the sense of exhaustion vanished, and he realised that he was moving somewhere in the region of causes behind the veil, beyond the gross deceptions of the senses, and released from the clumsy spell of space and time. Without great surprise, therefore, he turned and saw that his companion had altered, had shed his overcoat and black hat, and was moving beside him absolutely without sound. For a brief second he saw him, tall as a tree, extending through space like a great shadow, misty and wavering of outline, followed by a sound like wings in the darkness. But when he stopped, fear clutching at his heart, the other resumed his former proportions, and Jones could plainly see his normal outline against the green field behind. Then the secretary saw him fumbling at his neck, and at the same moment the black beard came away from the face in his hand. "'Then you are, Thorpe!' he gasped, yet somehow without overwhelming surprise. They stood facing one another in the lonely lane, trees meeting overhead and hiding the stars, and a sound of mournful sighing among the branches. "'I am Thorpe,' was the answer in a voice that almost seemed part of the wind." and I have come out of our far past to help you, for my debt to you is large, and in this life I had but small opportunity to repay. Jones thought quickly of the man's kindness to him in the office, and a great wave of feeling surged through him as he began to remember dimly the friend by whose side he had already climbed, perhaps through vast ages of his soul's evolution. "'To help me now?' he whispered. You will understand me when you enter into your real memory, and recall how great a debt I have to pay for old faithful kindnesses of long ago, sighed the other in a voice like falling wind. Between us, though, there can be no question of debt, Jones heard himself saying, and remembered the reply that floated to him on the air, and the smile that lightened for a moment the stern eyes facing him. Not of debt, indeed, but of privilege. Jones felt his heart leap out towards this man this old friend, tried by centuries and still faithful. He made a movement to seize his hand, but the other shifted like a thing of mist, and for a moment the clerk's head swam and his eyes seemed to fail. "'Then you are dead,' he said under his breath with a slight shiver. Five years ago I left the body you knew,' replied Thorpe. "'I tried to help you then instinctively, not fully recognising you, but now I can accomplish far more.' With an awful sense of foreboding and dread in his heart, the secretary was beginning to understand. "'It has to do with—with—' with... "'Your past dealings with the manager,' came the answer, as the wind rose louder among the branches overhead and carried off the remainder of the sentence into the air. Jones's memory, which was just beginning to stir among the deepest layers of all, shut down suddenly with a snap— and he followed his companion over fields and down sweet-smelling lanes where the air was fragrant and cool, till they came to a large house. 
standing gaunt and lonely in the shadows at the edge of a wood, and was wrapped in utter stillness with windows heavily draped in black, and the clerk, as he looked, felt such an overpowering wave of sadness invade him that his eyes began to burn and smart, and he was conscious of a desire to shed tears. The key made a harsh noise as it turned in the lock, and when the door swung open into a lofty hall, they heard a confused sound of rustling and whispering, as of a great throng of people pressing forward to meet them. The air seemed full of swaying movement, and Jones was certain he saw hands held aloft and dim faces claiming recognition, while his heart, already oppressed by the approaching burden of vast accumulated memories, he was aware of the uncoiling of something that had been asleep for ages. As they advanced, he heard the doors close with a muffled thunder behind them, and saw that the shadows seemed to retreat and shrink away toward the interior of the house, carrying the hands and faces with them. He heard the wind singing round the walls and over the roof, and its wailing voice mingled with the sound of deep collective breathing that filled the house like the murmur of a sea, and as they walked up the broad staircase and through the vaulted rooms where pillars rose like the stems of trees, he knew that the building was crowded row upon row with the thronging memories of his own long past. "'This is the house of the past,' whispered Thorpe beside him, as they moved silently from room to room. "'The house of your past. It is full from cellar to roof with the memories of what you have done, thought, and felt from the earliest stages of your evolution until now. The house climbs almost up to the clouds and stretches back into the heart of the wood you saw outside.' but the remoter halls are filled with the ghosts of ages ago, too many to count, and even if we were able to waken them, you could not remember them now. Some day, though, they will come and claim you, and you must know them, and answer their questions, for they can never rest till they have exhausted themselves again through you, and justice has been perfectly worked out. But now follow me closely, and you shall see the particular memory for which I am permitted to be your guide, so that you may know and understand a great force in your present life, and may use the sword of justice, or rise to a level of great forgiveness, according to your degree of power. Icy thrills ran through the trembling clerk, and as he walked slowly beside his companion he heard from the vaults below, as well as from more distant regions of the vast building, the stirring and sighing of serried ranks of sleepers, sounding in the still air like a cord swept from unseen strings, stretched somewhere among the very foundations of the house. Stealthily, picking their way among the great pillars, they moved up the sweeping staircase and through several dark corridors and halls, and presently stopped outside a small door in an archway where the shadows were very deep. "'Remain close by my side, and remember to utter no cry.' whispered the voice of his guide, and as the clerk turned to reply, he saw his face was stern to whiteness and even shone a little in the darkness. The room they entered seemed at first to be pitchy black, but gradually the secretary perceived a faint reddish glow against the farther end, and thought he saw figures moving silently to and fro. "'Now watch,' whispered Thorpe, as they pressed close to the wall near the door and waited." but remember to keep absolute silence. It is a torture scene. Jones felt utterly afraid, and would have turned to fly if he dared, for an indescribable terror seized him and his knees shook. But some power that made escape impossible held him remorselessly there, and with eyes glued on the spots of light he crouched against the wall and waited. The figures began to move more swiftly, each in its own dim light that shed no radiance beyond itself, and he heard a soft clanking of chains and the voice of a man groaning in pain. Then came the sound of a door closing, and thereafter Jones saw but one figure, the figure of an old man naked entirely and fastened with chains to an iron framework on the floor. His memory gave a sudden leap of fear as he looked, for the features and the white beard were familiar, and he recalled them as though of yesterday." the other figures had disappeared, and the old man became the centre of the terrible place. Slowly, with ghastly groans, as the heat below him increased into a steady glow, the aged body rose in a curve of agony resting on the iron frame, only where the chains held wrists and ankles fast. 
cries and gasps filled the air and jones felt exactly as though they had come from his own throat and as if the chains were burning into his own wrists and ankles and the heat scorching the skin and flesh was upon his own back he began to writhe and twist himself spain whispered the voice at his side and four hundred years ago and the purpose gasped the perspiring clerk though he knew quite well what the answer must be to extort the name of a friend to his death and betrayal came the reply through the darkness a sliding panel opened with a little rattle in the wall immediately above the rack and a face framed in the same red glow appeared and looked down upon the dying victim jones was only just able to choke a scream for he recognized the tall dark man of his dreams with horrible gloating eyes he gazed down upon the writhing form of the old man and his lips moved as in speaking, though no words were actually audible. "'He asks again for the name,' explained the other, as the clerk struggled with the intense hatred and loathing that threatened every moment to result in screams and action. His ankles and wrists pained him so that he could hardly keep still, but a merciless power held him to the scene. He saw the old man with a fierce cry raise his tortured head and spit up into the face of the panel, and then the shutter slid back again, and a moment later the increased glow beneath the body, accompanied by awful writhing, told of the application of further heat. There came the odour of burning flesh, the white beard curled and burned into a crisp, the body fell back limp upon the red-hot iron, and then shot up again in fresh agony. Cry after cry, the most awful in the world, rang out with deadened sound between the four walls, and again the panel slid back, creaking, and revealed the dreadful face of the torturer. Again the name was asked for, and again it was refused, and this time, after the closing of the panel, a door opened, and the tall, thin man with the evil face came slowly into the chamber. His features were savage with rage and disappointment, and in the dull red glow that fell upon them he looked like a very prince of devils. In his hand he held a pointed iron at white heat. "'Now the murder,' came from Thorpe, in a whisper that sounded as if it was outside the building and far away. Jones knew quite well what was coming, but was unable even to close his eyes. He felt all the fearful pains himself, just as though he were actually the sufferer, but now, as he stared, he felt something more besides, and when the tall man deliberately approached the rack and plunged the heated iron first into one eye and then into the other, he heard the faint fizzing of it and felt his own eyes burst in frightful pain from his head. At the same moment, unable longer to control himself, he uttered a wild shriek and dashed forward to seize the torturer and tear him into a thousand pieces. Instantly, in a flash, the entire scene vanished, Darkness rushed in to fill the room, and he felt himself lifted off his feet by some force like a great wind and borne swiftly away into space. When he recovered his senses, he was standing just outside the house, and the figure of Thorpe was beside him in the gloom. The great doors were in the act of closing behind him, but before they shut he fancied he caught a glimpse of an immense veiled figure standing upon the threshold with flaming eyes— and in his hand a bright weapon like a shining sword of fire. "'Come quickly now. All is over,' Thorpe whispered. "'And the dark man!' gasped the clerk, as he moved swiftly by the other side. "'In this present life is the manager of the company. "'And the victim?' "'Was yourself.' "'And the friend. He I refused to betray.' "'I was that friend.' answered Thorpe, his voice with every moment sounding more and more like the cry of the wind. You gave your life in agony to save mine. And again in this life we have all three been together. Yes, such forces are not soon or easily exhausted, and justice is not satisfied till all have reaped what they have sowed. Jones had an odd feeling that he was slipping away into some other state of consciousness, Thorpe began to seem unreal. Presently he would be unable to ask more questions. He felt utterly sick and faint with it all, and his strength was ebbing. "'Oh, quick!' he cried. "'Now tell me more. Why did I see this? What must I do?' The wind swept across the field on their right and entered the wood with a great roar, and the air around him seemed filled with voices and the rushing of hurried movement. "'To the ends of justice!' answered the other, as though speaking out of the centre of the wind and from a distance. 
which sometimes is entrusted to the hands of those who suffered and were strong. One wrong cannot be put right by another wrong. But your life has been so worthy that the opportunity is given to... The voice grew fainter and fainter. Already it was far overhead with the rushing wind. You may punish, or... Here Jones lost sight of Thorpe's figure altogether, for he seemed to have vanished and melted away into the wood behind him. His voice sounded far across the trees, very weak and ever rising. Or if you can rise to the level of a great forgiveness... The voice became inaudible. The wind came crying out of the wood again. Jones shivered and stared about him. He shook himself violently and rubbed his eyes. The room was dark. The fire was out. He felt cold and stiff. He got up out of his armchair, still trembling, and lit the gas. Outside the wind was howling, and when he looked at his watch, he saw that it was very late and he must go to bed. He had not even changed his office coat. He must have fallen asleep in the chair as soon as he came in, and he had slept for several hours. Certainly he had eaten no dinner, for he felt ravenous. End of chapter 2 of The Insanity of Jones